This is Twit. Jason Howell, tell us about our USB future. Oh, well, you know, I got to say, I've been living in the USB-C future for quite some time now. And apparently, a whole lot more people are about to experience this in a couple of years at the EU. Well, it seems like the EU is going to have its way. The EU is making a lot of news lately uh, as it's making moves to regulate various aspects of uh, how the tech companies, the big tech companies are doing business. The latest move is an agreement to require the use of USB-C charging uh, in a wide swath of electronics. And joining us right here, right now, to talk about the details of this agreement is Sharon Harding from Ars Technica. Welcome to the show, Sharon. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. I'm glad to have you here. Thank you for hopping on to talk about this. So um, this story definitely caught my attention. I'm an Android user. Been, uh, you know, in, I would say in the in the Android world, USB-C has been a port technology for charging, for data transfer, uh, for quite a while. It took a couple of years for all of the Android devices to kind of move over, and now it's to the point where if you get a USB, you know, an earlier uh, form of USB port, it it just feels archaic and like, what the heck are you doing? Apple, of course, different company, they have different standards there. Uh, so we're going to talk about all that and how this USB-C requirement in the U. Uh, in the EU actually impacts all of that. But first, tell us a little bit about this agreement specifically, what it calls for exactly, and kind of how wide that net goes. Okay, yeah. So what's been announced this week is a provisional agreement between the European Union's Parliament and Council outlining what this USB-C mandate, so to speak, will look like. So what they decided is across a number of consumer tech categories, so we're talking smartphones, digital cameras, tablets, uh, handheld video game consoles, e-readers, uh, earbuds, headphones, headsets, any of those products that have wired charging will have to offer USB-C charging uh, by the fall of 2024 is what they're looking at. So the parliament and council still have to formally sign off on all this, but once the law takes effect, laptops will have 40 months to comply as well. So also in this agreement is what they're calling a harmonized charging speed for devices in those categories that claim to have fast charging. And also in the agreement, the EU decided that vendors will have to provide information on charging characteristics like charging speed. And when shoppers buy one of these products in those categories, they should have the option to buy it with or without a charger. Okay. Well, then that's, that's a lot more than just the USB-C requirement specifically. So I'm happy you kind of uh, split that out as well. That's important. What, um, what was the driving force? Like, is the EU talking uh, specifically about the why here? Are they, you know, I mean, obviously they've mentioned, uh, they mentioned, you know, e-waste as one example and, and, and all that, but uh, did they spell that out exactly like what the driving force is for this? Yeah, so e-waste is uh, a big one. Uh, according to the EU, they believe that chargers account for about 11,000 tons of e-waste per year. Mm. So that is definitely a, a big driver. Um, the other uh, driver behind it is the idea of giving consumers more choice and more information. So this has actually been a long time coming. Uh, Parliament has been pushing this for 10 years. And in September, uh, you might have heard the European Commission also made news as it announce its plans to enact legislation around this. So we've had some time to kind of wrap our heads around this. Um, but also in terms of the why and the idea of, you know, giving consumers more information and power, um, the EU believes that uh, shoppers will save up to 250 million euros a year on unnecessary charger purchases. And then, you know, by giving consumers information on things like charging speed, um, you know, they believe it'll make it a little bit easier for consumers to make the right purchasing decision so they don't have to, you know, end up buying a new one down the line and throwing that one out um, anyway. Yeah, I know. Well, I mean, you know, here at Twit in particular, like we are, are practically swimming in technology. And so I'm sure we all have like I have a drawer in, in my office, just around the corner, and the middle drawer uh, of this filing cabinet is filled. Like, you can hardly even close the drawer because I've got so many chargers and cables, and that's what we're talking about as far as e-waste e is concerned. But not everybody has that. Like, I realize that we kind of live in a in a 
you know, we work here at a company where our business is technology. Not everybody's going to have that technology. Like, do they make any any sort of comments or claims around what companies, uh, I don't know, might might do in that regard? Like, I'm, I'm assuming a lot of companies are going to be cutting down on the chargers that it, they include in packaging, but those chargers are still necessary. Did they address that at all? Um, I mean, that is a, a concern, especially, you know, I'm sure we'll get into this as we talk about I, Apple yeah. and all the lightning chargers that are, are already out in consumers' homes and in sure. stores and in the tech ecosystem. So I think that is um, a big point that uh, companies and people that aren't so excited about this are bringing up. But I think the the EU stand, their government stance is that, you know, this is what will ultimately be right for the consumer and it'll help them also make better decisions. So like you and me have all these cables, their idea is that, you know, someone who's not as tech savvy can just buy the right charger, buy the right cable, and they won't have a problem because that's part of the reasons why some people end up with uh, all these different cables. They think it'll work or it'll have the right charging speed and they find out it doesn't. That one goes in the drawer, they buy a new one. So right. that's kind of the idea here. And you never quite throw it away because you never know, you might get that device <laughs> somewhere down the line and that's the exact cable that you need. Meanwhile, I haven't even touched anything in that drawer for years. Um, so as I said at the top, Android devices uh, in particular have been using USB-C widely for a number of years now. Apple, as you mentioned, seems to be the company, at least as far as smartphones are concerned, uh, that that is likely to be impacted the most here. Has there been any sort of response from Apple in reaction to this? Because, I mean, th that seems to be the headline and a lot of the, the pieces that were written about this is, uh-oh, Apple's going to have to make some big changes in the next couple of years. Yeah, so Apple hasn't responded to this week's news yet, but it has commented in the past. Like I said, this has been a few years coming. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Apple uses its lightning chargers, um, as you guys know, for iPhones and the base model iPad. And so it stands for years now. It's been that such a mandate as the EU's creating will stifle innovation. And um, they've also pointed to, as I kind of just mentioned, an, an increase in e-waste of lightning chargers, cables, yeah. adapters, those accessories all start becoming useless and that it could also confuse customers. So they say, I mean, I think, you know, <laughs> it might actually make things simpler down the line and a customer can learn USB-C versus Lightning, but that is something that Apple has said. So in 2021, actually, Apple said there are over a billion active iPhones in the world. So that gives you an idea of the scope of the ecosystem of charging parts that we're looking at here that could potentially become useless. Um, that said, the EU has responded to those concerns, at least partially. Um, they have noted that Apple could technically keep its Lightning or any other proprietary uh, charging port or connector it wants. It would just also have to offer USB-C. <laughs> and if we know Apple, we know <laughs> they hate buttons, they hate ports. They're not going to add two ports on their iPhone. Or Can I don't know, imagine? Michael, what do you think? They're not doing that. <laughs> they would rather go completely portless. And, yeah, yeah, completely, right? Yeah. And just go fully uh, wireless charging and that sort of stuff, which I guess would be one way to get around this. But that, that might carry its own other consequences as a result. Um, one big question that I have about this is just about the technology itself, right? Like you mentioned just a few minutes ago, they've been working on this for 10 years. If you go back in time 10 years ago and envision a world <laughs> where they actually created this rule, this law, whatever it's going to be 10 years ago, what was the port that they would have like mandated then? And here we are 10 years later, and we probably now through now eyes looking at that would go, oh my goodness, I'm so happy we aren't locked into that port. Like, USB-C is five years old already. By the time this is in place, it's going to be seven years old. So it's going to be a seven-year-old kind of technology, port technology. And there will be a time somewhere down the line when that is uh, outdated or that there or there is a good reason for that be, to be replaced. Is there any kind of thought or, or long-term view as far as that's concerned, um, you know, as far as this just kind of burning out at some point and it make doing more harm than good, I guess, is where I'm going. So the good news is that the EU says it's open to evolving and adapting the policy as technology develops. So should the EU find a technology that it it believes is better for the consumer? And that's the key, like the government has right. to agree upon that. Right, they're deciding, yep. 
Right. Yeah. So if, if they find a technology like that, that they think will serve consumers better than USB-C, they say they're open to changing the policy and doing that. Um, they even say, you know, that they encourage tech vendors to come speak with them and work with them. Uh, they've noted that they have tech engineers on the commission. So they say that they're open to, you know, changing it. They're, their goal is not so to make it so that USB-C is the ultimate last ever wire charging <laughs> yeah. option. The one port to rule them all, as Micah said. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I could see why, you know, people or companies might actually become less interested in developing new wire charging techniques. You know, you think about, you know, how many resources will companies be wanting to invest in R&D for a future that might end up being used across products and won't be a differentiator. Yeah. And when, you know, when USB-C becomes very prominent in their related accessories and everywhere in everyone's home. So there is something to consider, like wondering if it will stifle innovation like inadvertently because people get so complacent and it won't become a differentiator per se, but the EU says, you know, we're, we're open to evolving with the times. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out. And again, we've got a couple of years leading up to that. So a lot to develop there. And then I, I think my final question has to do with this is, you know, this is a requirement in the EU, but there's, there's no way that Apple, uh, just taking Apple as an example, is going to create two different versions of the iPhone, right? Like one with a USB-C port and then one with a lightning port. I, I mean, I don't know. Is is it possible that this regulation in the EU impacts worldwide? I mean, I think I think undeniably it's that's probably what's going to happen. But what do you think? Yeah, I mean, you know, you bring up wireless charging. So I would say, like, let's not forget that, you know, it's not quite at the point, I think, where we'll want to convert completely to that due to. Um, how challenging it is to make that efficient in terms of transferring power and data. But there, that is something still open for vendors to work with and play with in terms of innovation. Um, and so in terms of the spreading globally, you know, or, you know, I could speak to the U.S. or I am, of course, um, you know, it took the, e, the EU like 10 years to get to where, where it is now. And as of right now, I'm not seeing that level, that level of lobbying and organization in the US. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, big tech and the idea of free enterprise has an extreme amount of value in this country. Um, what there is a big organized push for right now in the US that I think is worth comparing against is the right to repair. Because mm. we have seen gains there. New York State is on its way to having the first law requiring right to repair for digital electronics. So that does show us that it's possible to pass laws in the US around you know, this kind of topic around consumer electronics, but it's, it would be incredibly challenging. It would require a lot of work and organization, and it's going to see a lot of resistance from big companies with a lot of money and oh a lot God. of influence, just like the right to repair has seen. Um, but, you know, I still think the policy could still have influence in the U.S., of course. Um, you just might see companies taking things into their own hands. Like last year, France passed a law requiring tech vendors to provide repairability ratings. And vendors like uh, Samsung and even Apple just started sharing their repair manuals, including outside of France. So that's, that's a possibility that companies just might start, you know, taking their own steps toward it without the law getting involved. And there's also the possibility of, you know, standardization, like we've seen with other technologies, uh, HDMI, display port and such, where we see big tech companies coming together and developing their own agreement without getting the government or legal mandates um, involved. And I think, you know, it's also worth noting that this law going in the EU, get, get go, well, sorry, this law going in the EU does have a lot of Americans and consumers talking. So yeah, if opinions and desires start to shift, that could be a driver for product change as well. No question. I mean, I think, you know, everybody who has these devices has felt the uh, the tug that that happens when you've got a device but you don't have an easy to find charger somewhere or whatever just the fact that there are so many different standards in charging and in other facets of technology so we've all felt what it feels like to have that that device in the wrong thing and uh so that's a pain that everybody recognizes so we can all appreciate that there's some movement there uh i certainly do well um sharon harding really appreciate you hopping on uh to talk with us about this sharon of course writes for arstechnica.com if people want to follow you online where can they find you Oh, believe it or not, I don't use any social media. So the best place to go is ourstechnica.com and check out my articles there. 
I'm uh, I'm jealous. That, that sounds delightful. <laughs> yes, <laughs> they, it's a simple life. <laughs> yeah, right. And actually, it's pretty easy. Just stop using social media if you want to go there. Uh, it's not that easy. I can tell you that firsthand. Sharon, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. We'll talk to you soon. Good. Thank you, guys. All right. Take care.